Uh, I'm Matt Roberts. I'm from Durham University. Uh, I do my work in both the Department of Archaeology and the Department of Computer Science. Uh, I started working in, I have got a background in software engineering, a background in uh, CS. However, machine learning, I only really started getting um, involved with it in the summer of 2017. And archaeology, I really only got started with that in October of 2017. So in both cases, I'm kind of coming to this from uh, the perspective of a newcomer, uh, trying to see how these uh, two disciplines could uh, um, be used to interact with each other. The primary research questions that uh, I've been attempting to pursue was, number one, how well does a machine learning data set created from a digital archive of a museum, uh, library, or a similar GLAM institution um, work with uh, uh, the utilization of machine learning. It started to expand a little bit when I started talking to folks in archeology span and they started asking me, well, how also could we try and apply this in a real world context? What sort of um, problems that are currently facing cultural heritage could we apply this to? And thus I've started to uh, also see whether or not it can be applied to issues currently uh, uh, facing uh, modern day uh, illicit traffic uh, trafficking of antiquities. The primary source of my data set has been from the Durham University Oriental Museum. Uh, this is a really nice uh, museum that uh, is, has had a long association with the university itself. Uh, it uh, came out of the School of Oriental Studies from the 1950s. It has a very large of, uh, of uh, objects and antiquities coming from uh, the uh, um, China, Japan, India, but also specifically from Egypt. And partly that's because uh, they had a Duke of Northumberland who, back in the 1880s to 1900s, went over to Egypt and acquired a lot of material. After he died mysteriously in Paris, that material then was given over to uh, uh, the Oriental Mu or to uh, Durham University and eventually found its way into the museum's archives. It was also supplemented by uh, Sir Henry Wellcome, um, a pharmaceutical industrialist around the same time, collecting lots of material from uh, all aqua uh, across uh, uh, Egypt, bringing it over to uh, uh, the UK, shoving it into uh, uh, various crates, putting them in warehouses. And then once again, when he passed away, that all got distributed to various museums across the, uh, the, um, the, the British Isles, which included Durham. So I actually have a fairly good uh, data set to, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to be working with, primarily because of the efforts that uh, the museum has been doing since about 2001. They've been digitizing their archives and they've been following a very um, precise manner of uh, approaching their, <coughs> their records. They have uh, file folders that are organized according to the provenance. Uh, so the various ways that uh, this material entered into their uh, archives, but also the way that they're tagging their files follows a very methodical scheme, as well as uh, their uh, digitation efforts uh, for photography. They'll take a photo of the front, back, left, right, top, and bottom, and label all of those within the file name itself. They'll also take sort of semi-perspective um, shots of uh, uh, the objects if they feel it's warranted. That means you have lots of data of a single object that you can start, uh, um, uh, that you can easily find within their computer system. Um, and also has uh, the uh, accession number for it. And so it just gave uh, me, as uh, someone coming from outside of the museum itself, a very easy way of being able to go through uh, all their material, scan through it, and try and figure out if there was a way that uh, um, could try and apply this in uh, um, a machine learning context. Uh, I'm glad that we've had the other uh, discussions earlier today because quite frankly, they've gone over what I've done. Um, my implementation is uh, pretty standard. It's uh, supervised machine learning. It's transfer learning. So um, uh, again, it's been uh, previously trained on ImageNet. Uh, in my case, we actually do have a uh, comparable uh, uh, data source. Uh, whereas with uh, flat landscapes, you're, you're not quite uh, um, matching up to the classes that are part of ImageNet. Here, we actually have various objects that are uh, uh, figurines of animals, figurines of humans, as well as everyday objects, pots, um, uh, 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 various vases, that sort of thing. And thus, I thought that this might be a really good uh, um, uh, way of applying transfer learning to my own. 
Nevertheless, I was still trying to get uh, to about 5,000 images, and uh, I'll show in a, a slide or two exactly how that rolled out. In terms of the model I was using, I've primarily been using ResNet, uh, various flavors. I also tried uh, AlexNet and VGG, but uh, I really had the best results from ResNet. Uh, I'm using PyTorch because other people in computer science at the university I'm working with are using PyTorch. So I was able to go and ask for help. Uh, otherwise, I've used a couple of different visualizations. Uh, TSNE, as you can see up here, just to try and explore the data a little bit. Um, but uh, end of the day, I mostly just use Matplotlib, uh, Matplotlib to be able to sort of visualize the, the work I'm doing. Uh, initially, what I did was split out the data into training, validation, and test sets. And I did that manually. However, as time went on, I found that was um, uh, uh, time intensive. And so instead, I started to uh, uh, use the data loader capability of PyTorch to be able to automatically split out my training and validation sets. Um, ended up, after a little bit of experimentation, doing a 20-80 split. So 80% of the uh, images would be turned into my training set. 20% 20 uh, 20 would be my validation set. And that worked out pretty well. Otherwise, uh, I'm using Atom as my optimizer. Uh, I'm using NLL loss as my uh, uh, loss function and uh, doing batches of about 32 images uh, per, per epic, um, 10 to the negative 4 for my lear uh, learning rate, and that seems to work out pretty well. For the actual classes that I'm training towards, I chose six, and I split them off uh, into Asiatic and Egyptian. Here we can sort of see the Asiatic ones. Uh, I did anthropomorphic, human figurines, zoomorphic, animal figurines, and then just various types of vessels. And you can kind of see the numbers of images I had associated with, the, with those. I'll show you in a little bit how much, uh, how many actual objects there were. But as you can tell, there's only about three groups there in the human, three groups in the vessel. However, there are a large number of zoomorphic. Those zoomorphics, those are primarily um, uh, jade, uh, jade carvings as well as um, Japanese Natsuke. Uh, with the Egyptian subcategories, you have a little bit more diversity. Uh, you have standing, head, torso, seated, uh, a lot of shakti. Just that's pretty standard if you're working with Egyptian material, but uh, also a lot of scarabs, uh, a lot of sokar hawks, um, thought baboons. So those ones, a little less uh, diversity, but still you have a, a, a large number of different types of uh, um, objects within that single class. And uh, not so much with vessels. Vessels, it was pretty much just jars, uh, uh, bases and pots, but also with some canopic jars. So end up uh, at the end, I had uh, six classes, human, uh, uh, animal, and vessel for each of my um, cultural groups. Uh, each one, I had about 750 to 900 images in total. Objects, about 120 to 150, 171 with the uh, uh, Egyptian figurines. Again, a lot of those were shaptis. Uh, and as I go went through the, the training, uh, did about uh, 1,100 epics on uh, my various models, which were all the various uh, variations of ResNet. And pretty much all of them would converge to 100% validation within 1,100 epics. Uh, also with a very nice training loss, validation loss. All these sorts of graphs are kind of what you're, you're looking for if you're trying to do a pretty standard uh, visualization uh, convolutional neural network. But the question then is, how can I try and test these? So even though I've had the validation and uh, a training set get, uh, to the point where it thinks that it can absolutely tell me anything I put into it is going to, to be correctly classified, what about when I try to uh, um, come up with ways of um, uh, 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 finding a real-world application? First test set that I put together was just display cabinet images. And this is still from uh, the Oriental Museum. So it was taking the photographs of these objects that it had been trained on, and the photos themselves that it had been trained on were from uh, ideal uh, photo lab uh, um, uh, uh, circumstances. So 
you had a very flat background, you had uh, um, uniform lighting, it was just the object itself, you're good. However, this display cabinet images, these were taken with a camera phone and uh, they had variations of light, they had uh, glass reflections, you had background clutter, you had other objects sort of sitting uh, um, right next to each other, and you had some blurring and uh, um, from motion of, um, well, frankly, me just going there and taking really quick snaps in the, the, the museum itself, which I left in because I thought, why not? Let's see how it works. Uh, and, uh, oh, sorry. what? Sorry. Uh, okay, sorry, one was out of uh, place. These are the display cabinet uh, case results. Um, so, uh, as was said, computer scientists, we like precision, we like recall, we like F-score. However, we also really like our uh, um, uh, convolutional matrices. Uh, this is your true label, that is your predictive label. What you want to see is a nice line going uh, um, uh, along the middle, showing that your true label and your predicted label are converging. Uh, what I found with the Oriental Museum display case results was that the uh, best results were from ResNet 50. Uh, and that it was, however, having a little bit of difficulty in the zoomorphic classes. So, I wanted to continue going on, decided to also try another sort of uh, um, museum display case uh, uh, test set. In this case, I decided I wanted to... Okay, I, I see what I did here. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, what I did was go to uh, uh, other museums that had similar collections. The British Museum had its ancient uh, e Egypt uh, cultural gallery, its China and South Asia cultural gallery, gallery as well as its Enlightenment room, and collected uh, uh, additional uh, test sets from there and ran it over the, the same sort of uh, um, uh, uh, set. And I do apologize, I just, these seem to be uh, out of order. Uh, <laughs> continuing on, just to, to, to bowl through. Uh, started working with the or uh, with uh, the archaeology group uh, they wanted to, to see how this could work with uh, a project that they're currently pursuing which is HEDAP the heritage documentation and protection uh, what they're doing is working with uh, um, to develop a tablet application that um, could uh, be deployed in a conflict zone specifically Libya or Tunisia uh, to be able to uh, fast uh, quickly record uh, objects from within their uh, collections to be then used for future uh, um, uh, 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 heritage protection in case any of those objects are stolen and end up on uh, the, the illicit market. Uh, I went in, I took the HEDAP tablet, uh, I took some objects from out of the Oriental Museum's uh, uh, collection and just rapidly uh, took photographs of them uh, to uh, see how well my trained model worked on uh, uh, objects that were of similar provenance, but which uh, were, were taken using the um, uh, uh, camera and uh, um, recording uh, uh, capabilities of uh, this uh, uh, tablet application. And it worked fairly well. Uh, this is all kind of uh, still showing some of the better results. I only was able to find a couple of uh, unphotographed uh, uh, human figurines uh, from uh, 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 Asia, but I still managed to, to get a decent number of uh, test images, and they were still showing that uh, ResNet 50 was performing well. However, there was kind of a bias towards uh, some of the zoomorphic classes that I'm still trying to understand. So just to kind of wrap up very quickly, um, I'm looking to uh, see whether or not uh, this uh, um, will suit the purpose that um, the uh, uh, researchers in archaeology I'm working with are, are intending. I'd say that this is sort of a technology readiness level three. Uh, I've shown some uh, interesting results in the lab. Uh, I've been able to do like an initial proof of concept, but it's not yet at the point where it can be uh, deployed out into like a real world context. Some of the technical challenges is that the um, data avail uh, availability, small data, uh, even with 5,000 images, this is still really uh, pushing the bounds of uh, um, what can be like uh, um, gotten out of a uh, um, sample set of this size. Uh, I have a lot of issues trying to figure out how to take um, what I've written up and make it into like an actual production ready and uh, deployable uh, um, product. 
And uh, I am finding that uh, with convolutional neural networks, it's driven more by classification rather than identification. And identification is really, uh, and content-based image retrieval is really what the, the folks I'm working with are looking for. However, I do think that there's some potential applications in heritage. Uh, I think that uh, this is a, a good way of being able to automate recognition. Uh, if you're starting to run into the issues uh, with the, the illicit, illicit uh, trafficking on say eBay or other uh, online uh, um, auction sites, probably rather than having someone going there and manually watching it, you're going to be wanting to develop tools like this to be able to automatically flag down uh, illicit material. It also has some uh, uh, capability within um, uh, museum content management systems. Um, other than that, just to give some suggestions, what I found was that um, the CRISP-DM data model uh, really matched the way that I uh, approached my data. Uh, even though it was uh, put in um, place and uh, mostly used for business uh, purposes, I did find that it still is a very good data model for if you're trying to get into, um, uh, if you're new to uh, uh, machine learning and trying to develop your own data set. Uh, I would just say that uh, some of the most important things I took away from it was know your data, know what sort of bias there is, uh, what, was, uh, what objects are most popular and thus most photographed, uh, what past research has been done. Again, I have a lot of scarabs in my data set just because someone at some point went in and photographed a lot of scarabs. Um, also, just to always be sure uh, to, to be continuously visualizing your data to find new ways of exploring it. Uh, you're having to deal with just massive of, uh, quantities of image data. And if you can try and uh, uh, come up with easy ways to uh, uh, help yourself visualize it, explore it, that's going to help you in the long run. Otherwise, just keep on watching changing technology. Hopefully we'll be uh, uh, approaching uh, a few shot and one shot learning soon. And just always know that uh, there's trends in uh, open source and computer vision. Uh, the fact that we're uh, uh, all here kind of discussing this uh, together kind of shows that there's, there's interest, but uh, that it is still a very rapidly evolving field. And I think that's it for me.